welcome to the Palm Court Podcast. This is Mike Palmer. I'm here again with Grant Balfour and Megan Citron. Welcome to the show. Hi. It's great to be back. We're it's great. This, We're all from my cohort. So that's, this is our this is our peep. So like we've been intentional about trying to cast a wide net, but things go deep when you talk about your own cohort, the folks who were actually at that school when you were there, you know, inside of say five, six hundred people. And then there's a closer set of folks who I would say, you know, they're definitely part of our social circle. They're Dr. Mark Sanders, Dr. Nick Tampio, and Dr. Daniel Harrison. We all went to college with them. Nick, I didn't know as well, Nick Tampio, but he's interesting. He's now a professor at uh, Fordham. Mark Sanders is a philosophy professor at UNC Charlotte, and Dan Harrison is a sociology professor at Lander University in South Carolina. But back in the day, they were just Mark, Nick, and Dan going to college with us, and then we recorded this conversation. It's another example of, you know, all four of us were able to get together and have a, a somewhat coherent conversation relatively soon after things started to go sideways at New College which is another indication of how strong many of the ties are among those of us who went to New College at the same time. You know, we've talked about it, how it's beyond that as well. Any impressions, any thoughts about this conversation, these folks? Hey, can I ask? Yeah. When exactly was this recorded? I believe it was early March. Yeah. Okay. So March. I think that the, she had just resigned, Pat Ogre had just resigned or whatever formally. Yeah. So it's an interesting moment in time. The fact that they're all doctors is something I kind of take for Mm -hmm. granted. It is something that is both reflected in the broader statistics about New College, but also I think all of our experiences. Like I like to say, you know, you can't throw in a, you can't throw a rock in an alumni event without hitting a doctor and a doctor of philosophy that is. Yes. Uh, Although we have other types of doctors, although we, we seem to have a lot of PhDs. Any impressions around that or thoughts about like recollections about these folks when when we went to school together? Well, I I enjoyed the kind of academic, you know, standpoint that they were coming from. I think Nick was talking about, you know, the philosophy of the school. And I think Dan was as well. And, you know, how it goes back to John Dewey, which I I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. I had ever heard anybody really talk about that. And that got me thinking about the way that I saw the connections between Spain and the kind of progressive Mm. education here and what's going on there. And John Dewey was hugely influential on progressive education here in Spain during the times before fascism. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I came away from this one with a kind of interior reading list because, you know, they're coming from a slightly different perspective than some of our other more let's kick it kind of conversations, (laughs) you know, and they didn't get a chance to talk about the personal quite as much, though I liked Mark's uh, anecdote about his attempts at Husserl and Heidegger on his own and how he, well, I won't spoil it, but. Yeah. I actually have a, have a memory of Dan Harrison early on in his, I'm a doctor career. When he asked me to guest lecture at a class he was teaching at New College. I remember a lot more about staying at the house he was staying at in Siesta Key. I can't remember whose house it was. Then I do like, I've had other people who are students in that class come up and tell me about it afterwards. And I honestly, I don't remember a thing I said other than, hey, I write for the Weekly World News and here's how we make stories. Right. Well, in in a true Gonzo fashion, you had just taken some ayahuasca before before lecturing, I would imagine. No, that was just my usual affect, actually. They, <laughs> they just mistook it for, you know, shamanic wisdom. More like shambolic wisdom. Yeah, shambolic wisdom, exactly, is more my style. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So anyway, there you got you got all sorts of interesting stuff with these folks. We'll we'll hopefully get them back in a, a new format. Have you know more conversations with these types of folks. If you're interested in being on the show, let us know. We don't want to just go deep with our cohort. We want to actually tell the story across all the years. But you know, it's easiest to go deepest with the folks you know. Hopefully, you enjoy it. We'll be back with more soon. Thank you for listening. I am joined by three guests, all of whom attended New College of Florida with me back in the 20th century. I'm joined by Dr. Daniel Harrison, Dr. Nicholas Tampio, and Dr. Mark Sanders. 
they all happen to be doctors. They all happen to have pursued academic careers and also wound up as guests on Trending in Education. So it's like a double win. Welcome to all of you. Thank you, Mike. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us again. This is the start of a joke, right? Three doctors walk into a podcast. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Yeah, unfortunately, the reason why we've been convened sort of on short notice is in response to some of what's been happening at the alma mater at, at New College in recent, really, weeks. You know, within the last two months, really, there's been new appointees on the board of trustees, and then through a couple of board meetings has resulted in President Pat Oker, who I did interview prior to her ousting, but she was fired. And that board meeting is interesting. It is also interesting in that Florida has the sunshine laws, so you can watch board of trustees meetings for New College of Florida through a live stream, which I was able to do. That's why I'm a little concerned about where this may go and how we can track it. And then there's also been a lot of characterization of New College that I don't agree with necessarily. And that's something that I think, at least my understanding, based on my experience with New College, is that my impressions are positive. The academic experience that I had there really did influence the rest of my life and my career. And then the three of you, each of you is, you know, working in academics. You sort of pursued that. Let's do a quick around the horn, maybe starting with you, Dan. Just sure. A quick, quick reintroduction of who you are and what you yeah. do. Okay. Well, I went to New College from 89 to 93, and I was a social science major. So I concentrated in, in sociology, psychology, and anthropology. And then I went to graduate school at Florida State University and finished up there in 2000. And I'm currently at Lander University in Greenwood, South Carolina. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about what New College is and sort of, you know, what it was meant to be. And so I think at some point we should probably talk about kind of, you know, the history of New College and, you know, how kind of the founders of New College envisioned the school to actually be kind of in practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe we could talk about some of our own experiences there. Yeah. And then at some point, obviously, we need to talk about New College Today, you know, I honestly haven't been really that involved in New College in decades, to be honest yeah. with you. I actually right. was fortunate enough to teach there. I taught there for a semester. Brain went on sabbatical in 98. Dr. David Brain. Yes. Dr. David K. Brain. Such a phenomenal name for a professor. But yeah, Brain was my advisor at New College, and I was lucky enough to try to fill his big shoes mm -hmm. um, in, in 98 for a semester. And so... I have experience, you know, being a student there and also being a faculty member. Yeah. So anyway, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yep. How about you, Nick? So I'm Nicholas Campio. I went to New College from 1991 to 1995. I wrote my dissertation on how Leo Strauss and Antonio Gramsci read Machiavelli. And it was kind of a funny project. And yet, you know, Leo Strauss criticized the Enlightenment. And I had never read anything like that. And my first book years later was my sort of response, like if you believe in the Enlightenment, how do you respond to Leo Strauss's challenge? And Antonio Gramsci has totally informed a lot of my public intellectual work about fighting wars of position and culture and the battlefield of ideas. So yeah, New College has completely shaped my my thinking, my career. You know, I'm, I think anybody who goes to New College has a certain ambivalence about the place. I don't know anybody who could just have purely good memories of the place because you know, I've just been, I've been reading the history of the school. There's a, a book written about the first, I believe, four decades. And you realize that like, oh my gosh, many of the problems that, that I saw when I was there go back to the beginning. And, and, you know, even when I was listening to the board meeting, I was hearing the, the current student body president, she would say things. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, like literally, like there's been, there have been certain problems with New College from the beginning that have never been rectified. And so anyhow, I, you know, I, I love the place for all of my criticisms. I'm grieving what happened, but, you know, I'm really eager to talk with you guys and, and see, you know, what you think is specific to New College and, and what you think is indicative of something bigger. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm Mark Sanders. I went to New College like Dan from 89 to 93. And I studied philosophy there under the mentorship of Doug Berger. I then went to the new school for grad school to pursue philosophy there. And I'm now at UNC Charlotte where I teach philosophy. 
And I would say that I, um, my new college experience informs my teaching kind of constant. I teach a class on philosophy of education where it's very explicit in front of mind, but in almost any conversation I have about when I'm making a syllabus, right? What kind of assignments am I, am I giving? How do I deal with grades, for instance, things like that. Like when we talk about what our curriculum should be, you know, in, in the, for the philosophy majors, and I'm thinking like, what was it like for me? What I, and I just, it was in some ways it was so very different. And in some ways it was like, you know, I mean, Nick wrote about Leo Strauss and Grand Gramsci, right? I mean, like, it's not like we were doing, you know, there were stories about people who like, you know, play the piano there and like get credit for it and stuff like that. But most people there did serious academic work that they themselves had a big role in guiding. And I think that that is difficult for me to expect from my current students at a very different type of university. Some of what I think was so central to new college informs the way I, I teach constantly and continually. So yeah, I have a big soft spot in my heart for new college with all of its weaknesses and, and foibles. And what's going on now is tough to watch. Yeah. And then for me, the thing that I feel was really formative is the, in the final analysis, which is the mission statement of new college in the final analysis, a student is responsible for his or her education. That is a pretty extreme position when it's pursued with some rigor, which honestly it, it kind of was, if anything, it was probably too individualistic and not structured enough for a lot of students so that, you know, yeah. students had trouble getting through. And, and I think new college as a model has had trouble in terms of retaining and graduating students. You know, Mark and I are, are dealing with the same thing because new college really at its best, the model was predicated on giving you a lot of rope. And, you know, so I went off and wrote a district, like a thesis that in many ways was a deeply flawed thesis. It didn't, it was really just me thinking through some hard stuff and not understanding a lot of what I was talking about. And it never gelled really. So, but you know, it, it was productive, right? It, it led to, it led to a lifetime of thinking about, you know, I remember at my thesis defense, Keith Fitzgerald asked me, so Nick, what is modernity? And like, you know, three decades later, I'm like still thinking, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get him so good. But I think give him this response, you know, I still don't have like a great response yet. And yet, you know, that's one of the things that I, that I'm still struggling with is can the model work where you give students a lot of rope? Because yeah. I, had a, I had a lot of very talented friends who made mistakes and didn't course correct in time, didn't have an advisor help them or yeah. maybe... And, and, and they, and they it seems out. like it, it works when it works. And then I think the challenge is more when it doesn't work for folks, there are certainly some more cautionary tales about folks who didn't, didn't get through, who probably could have been, you know, frankly, socially promoted in another academic environment. And they probably would have gotten their degree and moved on in their life. But since new college does require you to actively engage in your academic experience. That was a tall order back in the 90s, and it seems like a much taller order now. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And for, I think for the benefit of people who really don't know too much about the new college model, you know, we, we might want to mention that it was designed to sort of mimic or copy new college at Oxford, England in important ways. And so it's, you know, it's, it's sort of ironic that people like DeSantis and the conservatives are claiming that New College is somehow a model of liberal education, when in reality, I think it's a very neoconservative or you know kind of libertarian model. Because as you mentioned, Mike, the mantra of New College in the final analysis, each student is responsible for his or her own education. And you have these contracts. So you have, you have to do seven contracts, which you negotiate with your advisor. You have to do three independent study projects. You have to do a thesis, which then you have to defend orally. Mm -hmm. And so it's like kind of a, a, a mini graduate school, I, mm -hmm. I think. Narrative and evaluations. Many, yeah. And, uh, yeah. You have, and, and also no grades, narrative evaluations. And I think early the, the tutorial model was, you know, I think way more, you know, sort of popular or, or you know, kind of common than it turned out to be. And that was, you know, one thing that they borrowed explicitly from New College Oxford. And so the idea was that 
you know, you would sort of go to your lectures and then you would meet with your professor, you know, these dons, you know, privately or kind of semi-privately with some other students and really benefit from that one-on-one feedback. You know, New College started as a private school, 60, it was tiny when it, when it began. I think they had like something like, what was it, like 60 or, or, or 90 students. I yeah. mean, it was just absolutely, and I think they had them out of the beach initially, like mm-hmm. on either Lido Key or maybe Siesta Key. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, later brought them to campus and then it, and, and then it grew, and, but then, you know, they went bankrupt in, in the seventies. And so then it was taken over by the university of South Florida. And then the, the setting for those who aren't aware yes, of it the setting is, is, is pretty is, breathtaking at times. It is on Sarasota Bay. The Ringling brothers had an estate out on the bay there and some of the buildings from the Ringling Brothers estate is still part of the campus down by the bay. And the dorms that many of us lived in were designed by the architect I.M. Pei. They're referred to as as the Pei dorms. So it is yeah. from an architectural experience. And, and then also you, you say, Dan, it's tiny. It was tiny. It still is. It's still tiny. And, and, and it's, it's surprising to me that, I mean, the enrollment is pretty much right where it was when when I left mm-hmm. 30 years ago, mm-hmm. uh, which is so, about, about 700. Yeah. But so, so new, Co- new college was a part of university of South Florida. They separated, what was it like mid nineties, I think. And then it became independent and, and it's become independent since then, but I, part of the state of Florida though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, I, I think that for a student to succeed at new college, they really have to have a, you know, a, a very sort of Kantian, and I know that Nick has written about Kant, you know, sort of conception of enlightenment in the sense of, you know, having the ability or the maturity to think for themselves, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And whether or not, you know, we had that mature, I think it's sort of maybe a debatable question. You know, part of me wonders, and I think we kind of touched on this before, whether or not students today have the same level of maybe autonomy or motivation or drive or ability to kind of shoulder, you know, their intellectual journey on their own. But to be honest, I think that the conservatives who are taking over new college, I, I don't think they're thinking about any of these issues. Right. I, I think that the takeover is really just an example of, of, of symbolic politics. Yeah, so like a couple of things, just Nick's story, like to me, like that's that's what it should be. Like, like when, you, when your idea is like, oh, I got to my, I defended my thesis, I didn't have everything figured out. Like, of course, like, you know, like as an undergraduate, especially, mm-hmm. but I think that kind of, you know, like that helps you, I think, as you kind of go through, like, you know, do we ever figure things out? Yeah, a little bit, but it's like, it's more about the ongoing quest that you're still thinking about those things, I think is the kind of thing, you know, propels a successful, life, I would say, but also an academic career. Mm-hmm. And in terms of yeah, the amount of freedom given to students at New College is maybe not for everybody. There are also certain, the size of the school, the faculty to a student ratio is not going to be replicable at other places. But I think one of the things I think about a lot is the quality of faculty and their, not just their ability to have as well as number of students in classes, but their ability to focus on teaching. And some did more research than others, but the expectation was that you focused on teaching and research as it related to teaching and the courses that you would teach. So we would get these great courses that Mm -hmm. the faculty would come up with. And they really had the time also to kind of connect individual students. And you can take advantage of that. I mean, I've had a a tutorial where it was me and two professors once a week, you know, like that's, that can't be replicable. I don't think at a place and maybe it shouldn't, but like just that experience to me was invaluable. And I think like, my, my, my point there, I think the focus on teaching by faculty is an important thing that we are, I think, definitely losing. And maybe we never had it, but we're definitely, it's not my experience with the teaching profession. I have tried and as in my particular role, I actually do focus on teaching. I should say that I'm not a tenured faculty. I'm officially now an associate teaching professor, which sounds very good, but it is a, a non-tenured track position. And so my expectations, while I do have some research expectations, almost all of it is geared towards teaching. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's something valuable that, that New College helped in, instilling me the value of that. 
Yeah, and and also New College ranks very highly in terms of percentage of graduates who ultimately pursue doctorate level work, which the three of you are examples of. That is something where, you know, maybe talking about the virtues first, what about the experience do you think sets you up for success? Well, I, I read a I read an interview with a, a graduate of New College from 10 years ago. So there was a flurry. There has been a flurry. Maybe we're still in the flurry of articles about New College. And, you know, it really is, you have to take responsibility for your own education. And, you know, what the student was saying was she wanted to go to a place without grades. And, you know, I'm I'm a full believer in that, right? I mean, I Every now and then students complain to me about grades and I'm like agonizing because like they're right, you know, but like if you're going to if you're going to play the game, you need to play it fairly. And and I mean, I once had a student just yell and scream at me for inconsistent grading. So, you know, I I'm a consistent grader now. I, I the lessons learned. And yet, you know, we all know if, if that grades are absurd, right, that what really matters is the quality of thinking in the long term. And, uh, you know, it's do you know, grading rewards conservative mm -hmm careful, cautious behavior and, you know, thinking requires venturing out into the unknown. So and just uh, to clarify to like new college, typically you would get a satisfactory or unsatisfactory. So, you know, there is a, a concept of meeting the criteria or an incomplete or, or an incomplete, but in order or, to, or, or possibly to, a, a, a SAT plus in some cases, a SAT plus plus, a SAT yeah. plus, but, but there is, there is at least some it's the equivalent of a pass fail, right? Like there is a sense that either you get credit by meeting the, the criteria for the class or not. And then rather than numerical grades, they're narrative evaluations. And, and I think that most people probably pass the class, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't really, I, I think you'd have to screw up pretty royally to get an unsad, but the way that new college is being portrayed in terms of, well, they just have this pass fail thing, you know, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't highlight, like, as you said, the very detailed narrative evaluations where the professor goes through and point by point talks about your performance on, you know, this exam, that paper, this presentation, and then give you very, you know, positive and uh, important constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that the new college did very well in terms of preparing me for graduate school, because every class is basically taught in a seminar sort of a fashion. And so when I went to graduate school, I was very comfortable, you know, speaking up in a class and actually many of the texts that, that I used, that I studied in my graduate sociology program, I had actually read before in, in my, in my sociology, you know, theory classes with, with David Brain. So that was very, very helpful. But I think that the main thing, you know, the main lesson, which I got from new college was just the fact that ultimately. If you want to learn anything, you have to effectively teach yourself. Yeah. And I think that that's something that a lot of people forget. Students these days, you know, expect, you know, to be spoon fed the information and the knowledge and, you know, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what's so valuable about the new college model is that it forces the students to be, you know, active participants in the educational process. Yeah. And, and then also writing, right? Like there is a lot of writing that is part of new college. And then the, the thesis was something that generally was a written exercise, or at least there was some, some similarities to academic publishing so that if you're able to actually clear that threshold, you're probably able to plug into more of an academic career path. There are some risks with that too, I guess, right? Like maybe on the flip side, you know, without naming names, but like there are, there are people who really had, who, who struggled with the model. You know, I have friends who, you know, eight, 10 longer years, many of them did ultimately graduate after more than say 10 years. But the fact that they couldn't get through quickly is very different than the idea of college as a bridging into your adult life where you can come out with a job and the ability to operate independently, you know, with some earning potential and, and equipped with the tools you need. Some of us struggle with that. And I think some of us struggled more than others with that. Maybe it's also, you know, the Gen X in me, but I feel like a little bit of the struggle is what it's about, you know, and the idea that it is hard is what made it meaningful in some ways, but any thoughts from the rest of you on 
because now there's a lot of supports built into to higher education. And I don't know how much of that's indicative of a broader trend, but I know back in the 90s at New College, you were really pretty much left on your own. You know, I teach at Fordham University and we just built the whole big mentorship program. Mixed feelings because, the, you know, the plus is that it's good for students to have somebody take an interest in their particular experience and make sure they're on the right path. So I think it's good for students. You know, I, I, I resent anything that intervenes between students and faculty. And, and so, you know, I mean, if some of these counselors or mentors don't like a major, you know, that's going to be big trouble for that major. So I don't, I don't know, but I mean, new college, you know, we were hot house flowers. We, we just developed without cultivation in a lot of respects. And so I developed some really good habits. And one good habit I have is that I just pick up big books and say, I'm going to read this big book. Mm -hmm. And that was something that, you know, I mean, you know, Mark is right that, that some people study piano and waste time, but a lot of us worked really hard on things we cared about. Hey, piano is a meaningful instrument. And people <laughs> they have a solid music performers. program there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I, I taught, I taught an ISP there and in independent study project in January. And I was teaching Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus, a super hard philosophy book. And outside there were kids doing medieval uh, sword, sword play. A, a little for, LARPing. Yeah. 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 So I was like, that's the same credit, but you know, I, I, it'll all work out in the end. But, you know, I mean, you know, one of the things that's hard about new college model is that like, it, it was not socialization in, into academia. Like I, I mean, I had a very rude awakening when I started grad school and it was like, wait, I got to read articles. Wait, hold on. I got to like do homework. Like, you know, I was used to just doing my own thing. And, and so I had a very like, and uh, it's interesting when you study the history of progressive education and new college is a progressive school sort of modeled on the philosophy of John Dewey, where, you know, you really personalized education, you know, historically, a lot of graduates of progressive schools struggle a little bit, you know, I mean, some employers don't want independent thinkers. They want you to do your job, mm. you know, and they want you to socialize and not be weird. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you look back, a lot of us did perfectly fine. We figured it out. You know, a lot of us have figured it out, but there's definitely, there's definitely some challenges when you do a, a kind of new college model of just do your own thing. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I would push back in some way, but also accent the idea that, yeah, it's, you are responsible. And so people do things different ways. I know for me, like I did an ISP on Glycerol and Heidegger where I read it on my own. And then I wrote a paper on it and it was garbage. And Bergman told me so. And he's like, you, you just, you, you're not getting this. So I sat down with him, took, I took a course with him on those. And I didn't just automatically get it, but I, I did need some guidance. And maybe not for everything. I could read, so I could read like, he was on my, I read Camus on my own before I got to college. Then I'm, but I'm reading Heidegger. I'm like, oh, this is insane. Like what's going on? And I did need some guidance to get it as much as I actually, as I actually could. Mm -hmm. But I kept work. I didn't just like give up. I kept working on it. Yeah. Um, I also just to jump into, I think it's a lot of, a little more intellectual guidance. And I think there was more on that front. And I think it was probably a little bit less in terms of like life skills, which is yeah. much more what is becoming, you know, kind of baked into a lot of higher ed nowadays. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, and, and, you know, given the, given the size of the school in a lot of these divisions or departments or, you know, programs or whatever, you would only have like maybe one or two professors. Right. And so what happens occasionally is that, I mean, sometimes you would have professors who would leave. Right. And so yeah. like Gary McDonough, for example, went to, I think it was Bryn Mawr. And then I had a Jim Ross, yeah. I think Mike, you know, he, he left after my first year mm -hmm. and then. So you have kind of that. And so people, you know, have this connection with a, with a professor and then the professor, you know, bails for whatever reason. And then they no longer, they have to kind of reestablish yeah. that. And then he had some other students who might, you know, rub a professor the wrong way. And they would say, you know what, I'm not going to work with you. And, and so then if you wanted a major in philosophy and then there's no yeah. philosophy, you know, profs who are willing to work with you, then, then, you know, you're sort of screwed there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, New College gives you a hell of a lot of rape. And so there were a lot of people who, you know, ended up hanging themselves either indirectly or, or not. And then you also had this, you know, sort of campus culture, you know, when we were there, there, there really wasn't a lot of oversight. Students were left to do pretty much what they wanted to do. If they pushed the boundary too much, then they would, you know, get into contact with law enforcement. And, and occasionally you had people who were institutional, you know, Baker acted. And so on and so forth, because, you know, one thing that 
the new college was was definitely known for back in the day was that you know students would work hard but they would also play very hard mm -hmm. and a lot of that play involved you know experimenting with psychedelic substances and things and you've had graduates like Rick Doblin for example who set up the the maps program and they were always sort of lurking around and you know because of some of those connections you know, for some people that there were plenty of opportunities to sort of lose their minds either you know temporarily or yeah. a little bit longer because they got a little too heavy into that scene and that's become a bigger issue you know at least in terms of recent history at the college where there were a number of incidents in the the mid 2010s yeah the uh, drugs have gotten harder from what i understand mm -hmm. you know which is which is alarming mm -hmm. D daniel raises a really interesting point about the personality matches and and to go back to an earlier conversation you know i had one all of us know a mutual friend who you know basically the chair of his thesis said no and then he had to spend i think a whole nother year at new college which is incredible you know and and you know this person has done fine in life but i mean i mean i don't know how you could be a happy alum of a school if basically that happened right so my advisor or chair just let me go on you know with a very flawed dissertation but this my friend did it and and it, he suffered and you know it's a year of your life like a year of your life when you like you know i don't want to get too much of an economist analysis but like you know that's a lot yeah. of your life to 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 be and i mean that's one of the you know that's part of my deep ambivalence about the place is that it's too small hmm. you know when you read the history of this of the school you know from the beginning they were like let's get it up to 1400 yeah and, and, you know, Mike Michelson, who was the president in the early 2000s, like, and he's a friend of mine and he's a great guy and a great, great con scholar. You know, he was trying to get up to 2000. And at the time I was like, oh, no, it's good to keep it small. But no, he was right. Like, you need right. a critical mass and you also need escape routes, you know? And mm -hmm. and so if if it's a match and it fits, it, it can be really great. But, you know, at a school like University of Florida, or Florida State, I mean, you have a lot more options. If If it's not a good fit, you can just go to the next person. But yeah. at New College, if there's a one, two, three person department and you don't vibe with any of them, you know, you got to change majors or, or figure out what to do. Yeah. And just to clarify, I'm not that ambivalent about New College. I pretty much loved my experience there and it was, That's good. it was really formative for me. I, I understand there's a lot of laws that, that we could showcase here, but the thing that I really appreciate is that it's founded on principles that are documented and that are different than what the majority of higher ed institutions are, are founded on. And I think that level of experimentation is net beneficial if we can learn from the experiment and if also the model can continue to evolve. And that's where, to me, the problem, less from my student experience, but I think more from the financial side, is that they're going to need more enrollments for this to ultimately sustain. But where do you all think this will ultimately go? You know, we are currently, you know, I, I think we talked about it and, and, you know, we can preamble all we like, but as we speak, there's a new president being installed. Uh, Richard Corcoran, I believe is his name. Uh, and that's from the new board that was uh, appointed by Governor DeSantis down there. That they're they're just getting going. I think initially met that there was a take out there that higher ed moves at a glacial pace. So despite the fact that these trustees are being appointed, new college is new college and the model will sustain and the culture will ultimately win out. Since they've moved so fast, you know, decapitated the old organization and now are installing a really conservative leader who likely doesn't really understand or respect the the culture that he's inheriting, we're likely going to face some some challenges. It's got to be extremely difficult for students, for faculty down there, for families of all of those folks. So, you know, our hearts go out to to everyone who's been impacted. It, you know, for us as alums, it's more how we think about the college and how we hope its legacy is is a positive one. But but obviously, we feel for the folks who are down there. You know, I just released an episode with. Uh, Aaron Hillegas, who is heading up the new data science master's program at New College, you know, folks who are actually living their lives and trying to make an impact with what they're doing. 
Any thoughts on how this might play forward? You know, we're trying to figure out what this becomes, but this will likely be an ongoing feed dedicated to these types of topics. So, you know, you don't need to have it all figured out right now, but anything you're looking for, any, any places you're, you're interested in seeing what happens next? Well, I think that, I mean, there's incredible uncertainty right now. And I just spoke to David Brain, the longtime sociologist, just yesterday. And on campus, no one really knows what's going on or, or what plan there is for the school. I would hope that there may be some new synthesis comes out of this that perhaps, you know, retains the very valuable aspects of the new college model. But honestly, I don't think that, that DeSantis and his cronies and, and, and the new board members really have delved down that deeply into kind of, you know, the philosophy of education that new college is, is grounded in and all that sort of a thing. My understanding is that it's a lot more about sort of symbolic politics. And it, and I think it has a lot to do with things like the visibility of trans students and, and, and non-gender conforming students on campus yeah. mm -hmm. who, you know, always have had a presence at new college. Some of you might remember Ansel Webb, also known as Queen Ansel. Rest in peace, Ansel. But he was the first person that I met when I got to New College on, on my campus visit. And, and he was an, an openly gay man who, who liked to dress up in drag. But there was only one Queen Ansel, right? Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that, you know, non-gender conforming students have become a lot more visible and, and perhaps outspoken on campus. And so when you have people from a very conservative administration showing up on campus, they really don't know what to make of it. Mm. Uh, and so I think their knee jerk reaction is we're going to shut it down. <laughs> right. Hey, I mean, new the, college, it's a very tolerant, my recollection tol back yeah. in the nineties was like tolerance right. was a, was kind yeah. of a core cultural principle right. where, and I think folks probably lean left, you know, definitely lean left, but also I knew plenty of folks who were more conservative in their views. And at least back in the nineties. Sure. Like it was more being critical of whichever lens you might be viewing things through. What that's now meant in recent years around gender and also around understanding it is a safe place if you are a trans student, knowing you could go to a college where you would feel safe. That was part of what attracted some of the students who were attending New College. How safe those students feel now is certainly a question. And then also how much the campus life and the culture becomes defined by the identities that become prevalent yeah. on campus yeah. is the other thing that when you have a small student body to kind of Nick's point, it's very contingent upon who you actually enroll and who is on campus, what your campus culture is. And that's why I do think it's going to be a really interesting time to either stay at new college or make the choice to attend. Uh, I'm, I'm curious where that goes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if you guys watched the, the board meeting. It was, it was live streamed and, mm -hmm. you know, it was a whole mix of emotions. And I, I didn't think that they were going to fire the president. I, I thought that you need somebody on the ground who knows what's happening to implement. And I thought as long as she stayed in place, she could have stopped some of the bad ideas. And so mm -hmm. I was really shocked. And, you know, one of the board members, Eddie Spear, wrote a sub stack about what his plans for the school were. And I read those and I was like, I mean, the guy, the guy has, the guy has no idea how higher ed works. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He runs like a Bible school in Bradenton, I believe. Yeah. Right. And, and so, you know, I, I just said, well, shoot, I, I can't see that going anywhere. And so I was really shocked when I heard her fired and, uh, you know, I'm friends with the vice president of the board and he interrupted her. And I think, I think maybe you explained this to me, to Mike, it was to sort of protect her from getting fired for cause. We're, I mean, we're all speculating. It, it is right, interesting when you can actually watch a board meeting and yeah. have some context going in and then speculate yeah. what, what's actually happening. Cause it did also sound as though she, it almost sounded like she was willing to resign. And I think had that been the case, you know, a lot of this, you know, Dr. Pat Oker, friend of the show, she also got, a, looks like she got a good severance package, which is, which is great. You know, cause the, the sad part there is that, you know, the metrics were actually starting to turn around under her leadership. Enrollment was coming back, you know, whether the model needs to be thrown out entirely, you know, outside of the model, it's like there, there's a mold problem on campus, like the pay dorms 
we're not designed to to live this long. Like there needs to be actual like management and governance of the school. And it seemed like she was doing well with that, which is why for political purposes to see her ousted without really a plan on how to continue the positives that are in place is certainly concerning. Mark, looks like you had some, yeah. right? So, yeah, so I wanted to go pick up there. So it seems to me that we've talked about some of the problems that New College has. Mostly, I think I'm with you, Mike, and the rest of it. I think it's mostly positives for me. But as somebody who did well there, graduated in four years, almost mm -hmm. kind of un unheard of, I think, you know. But the problems that exist at the college, I don't, depend on how you, and I'm, I'm not keyed into how uh, difficult they actually are, but if there are problems, those are not the problems that are being addressed by what I would consider Correct. at least like a hostile takeover mm -hmm. by uh, DeSantis. And it's interesting to me that they are doing this kind of hostile takeover and makeover, mm -hmm. maybe you know, disguising it as we're here to fix the problems, but clearly what they're doing is making the school, which strikes me as weird because I mean, you could just defund it, right? That's one right. thing you could do. And and they could just make their own school somewhere else. They decide Correct. to make their own school here, which is what I really am kind of, you know, aghast mm -hmm. at and, and kind of up, up, upset with. But I would like to know, and not here, but maybe in future episodes, to get down to figure out what has been the problem with trying to raise enrollment of students. Is it that there are some people that want the smallness? And I, and I agree. I think most people that went to New College or a lot of them that went and liked it liked the smallness of it, but almost everybody also says like, yeah, but it's kind of too small. Too small yeah. And so what that number is, is one thing, but for a long time, they've been, throughout the history, they've been talking about raising the numbers. What are the, is it a problem of, what, what I said, I don't know what the problem is to raise it. I'd be interested to know what those problems, because those would be things that they, we could address in addition to just general funding for upkeep of facilities. Right. Again, none of those, so I think, you can raise student enrollment and keep up the facilities without drastically changing the kind of philosophical pedagogy behind New College. And not that I'm interested in doing, yeah. but we're fighting this other fight right now against like people who have no understanding of or interest in what New College is about. It, it does seem like there's a recruiting and a admissions well, problem. Right? There's, there's a 74% yeah. acceptance rate, you know, and low enrollment numbers means not that many people are even applying. You know, yeah. so I, I think and, that's but, where the new culture may begin to attract a different type of applicant. And that model could ultimately be sustainable. But to your point, Mark, just start your own, start your own college. You know, I, I don't really, if you want to build the hills out of the South, found it, you know. Yeah. And also the, uh, apparently the foundation is, is in pretty rough shape too. Yeah. So the, the foundation is hemorrhaging money mm -hmm. left and right. And I guess they really don't have kind of a, a clear plan for, mm -hmm. you know, how to raise money, mm -hmm. you know, given the current environment. And, you know, back when we, we were called, I think that some of you may remember, I mean, there was actually a thing called reinventing new college back in like the late eighties, mm -hmm. early Eric Schickler, who was, I'd like to get Schickler, maybe, you know, yeah. political scientist at, at, at Berkeley chair of the department. He did one to, yeah. to, well, there's a bend, thing now that the challenge is here. Right? There, there well, is a new challenge now, which is still ongoing. I saw like Pat started well, this challenge. The new college challenge thing, which brain is involved in, and, and it's all about sort of redesigning new college. And, and he's been working with a number of top schools, including yeah. like Yale and university of Florida and mm -hmm. to redesign the campus because infrastructure as, as you mentioned, is like a major issue and apparently Capels is uninhabitable right now. Yeah. And like half of, you know, the first court in, in the paid dorm is like uninhabitable because, right. because of all this mold. Yeah. And apparently it's really hard to raise money for like mold remediation because like no one wants to give money, it's not exciting. Uh, you know, for that particular type of type of a project. Right. And, and, it, so, and, it, and it does um, sound like on the, I know we're getting close on time too. It does sound like on the fundraising side is part of why Dr. Oker left. Cause I, I think there will be new ways to reach out to new patrons besides the state who also has now done a one-time $15 million funding and $10 million on an annual basis. So New College will be getting more funding from the state government and there will be new donors that they're reaching out to. And then what does that actually turn into? We don't know. I know we're at time, closing thoughts. I would love to see New College survive 
in some healthy form that allows right. academic freedom. And the fact that the state gave 15 million and the fact that DeSantis put, you know, his, one of his closest aides as the president of the school, at least signals that they don't want it to go under. Correct. You know, so I think I would rather see a reconstructed new college than no new college. Yeah. But, but you know, I'm definitely, I'll be watching, you know, and, and hoping that the best possible scenario unfolds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's pretty much how I feel too. I mean, like, like I said earlier, I mean, I, I would love to I mean, sort of have the thesis, right? Which is what new college was. And then the antithesis, which is what perhaps DeSantis and his cronies are proposing. Are you getting so, Hegelian? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I didn't am <laughs> getting Hegelian. And so we have some. We have some, perhaps some, some new synthesis, which could maybe in, in the context of perhaps reinventing new college, you know, I mean, it is 63 years old now, you know, perhaps we can get something, something better, you know, it's, it's, it's not a perfect system, right? I mean, right. we'll talk probably more about the flaws later, but mm -hmm. I, I would love to see it survive because I think the, I think the model is, is extremely valuable and we need, you know, in, in my view, we need more places like new college uh, rather than less of them. Mm -hmm. And not just at, at the college level, but also, you know, K through 12 too. Yeah. So I have, I don't have much optimism at all for DeSantis and the people that are funding new college from state level acting in good faith at all. So this kind of restructuring, I am, I don't know. And what they have done so far is as much as shocked as I was to see Ochre go in the way that it happened, it was kind of jolting, but they had the power to do that. They don't have the power at least easily to my understanding to get tenured faculty up off yeah. of this, which they claim that there's some of them they can do. So this fight as it goes on is interesting. Mm -hmm. And if it really is a matter of funding, there's a chance that maybe new college being in the news Correct. Would appeal to them though. Again, student enrollment right now is going to be like, I, why would you apply there right now? I right, hope right. people do who want to, but, but in terms of funding to get some of this stuff done, maybe more people know about this. And if it's beginning to be couched in New college is kind of the locus, but also Florida education more generally, and then education over the whole country. So I have people who never heard of new college yeah. finding out that I went there, reaching out to me like, oh my God, what's going on? Like we mm -hmm. have to do something about not right. just new college, but DeSantis and beyond DeSantis, what's going on mm -hmm. in terms of what education should mean. So there's, that's where I kind of have hope, but we need a lot more expertise to talk about that. Yeah. And it does feel like just to bring it home with a lack of expertise, it does seem a little bit like when Obi-Wan lets Vader strike him down, where, you know, if you get me now, I will become stronger. That's the most positive framing that I've heard of this, which does allow us to end on a ray of hope. And it is in part why I think trying to get more people talking about their understanding, their stories, their understanding of what's good and worth retaining about what we love about New College. That's something we're going to continue to explore. Thank you, Nicholas Tampio, Daniel Harrison, Mark Sanders. If you're interested in doing more of these, I'd love to have you. And hopefully we can spread the word, get more folks from New College and other stakeholders represented. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.